Uh, you know, keep in mind the subject here is what causes climate change. And our next talk is about what doesn't cause climate change. This is a question you have to answer. And this is uh, Dr. Sigelstad, and you'll enjoy his accent. He's Associate Professor of Resource and Environmental Geology at University of Oslo, Norway. And you can read the rest of his bio online. And is this one being broadcast? Are we being broadcast live or the other session? This one is. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to dedicate this talk to uh, Professor Spegni Jaworowski, uh, who died half a year ago and who I had the pleasure to work with for many years on the AW, IGW dogma. Uh, I was asked uh, by James Taylor to uh, give a talk about the geochemistry of CO2, and I said, uh, well, the facts haven't changed. I have nothing new to add. And he said, well, please come and tell us the facts. So first principles are still first principles, and that's what I will be talking about. Well, CO2 goes up and temperature goes down, and there seems to be no cause and effect from CO2 on temperature. Now, what is CO2? CO2 is a colorless, odorless, non-toxic gas, no pollutant at all, and uh, it has very strong bonds between the two oxygens and the carbon. They stick together, and uh, hence CO2 is not very reactive. It may be dissolved in water, of course, but uh, an analogy is how strongly two men, oxygens, each with their two arms, would like to stick to a beautiful woman, the carbon. <laughs> Some daily uses of CO2, fire extinguishers, we say they are good, baking soda, everybody likes their bread, uh, soda pop drinks, beer, champagne, uh, neutralizing agent for acid lakes, life jackets, cooling agent, preservations of food, and product of our breeding. We eat the carbohydrate, we breathe in the oxygen, and we breathe out CO2 and water, and from this we get energy. Uh, among the atmospheric gases, the CO2 is just a thin line in this pie chart. If I can get an arrow here, just a thin line here. While water vapor is much more, 2.7 weight percent, while the CO2 is just 0.05 weight percent. If you look at carbon reservoirs in the Earth, the atmosphere contains just a little dot in the corner here. That's the atmosphere versus the oceans versus sediments. So CO2 is just minute. But you cannot invite a geochemist without getting some chemical reaction equations. So the photosynthesis, the plants, they love the CO2 with the water, with energy, they make carbohydrate plus oxygen, and we on the other side, we breathe, then the reaction goes the other way, uh, we breathe in the CO2, I, we have eaten the carbohydrate, and we produce CO2 and water and the energy for living. So the law of mass action says if you increase the CO2 and they increase the water, and increase the heat, temperature, and all that, this will make the chemical reaction go from left to right, making the plants produce more carbohydrates. That's like Craig Ito was telling you yesterday. And we need this for, for living to make the carbohydrates that we eat. So I will say CO2 is the gas of life. So I will claim regulation, taxation, and control of CO2, the basics of life, is betraying the universal declarations of human rights. <laughs> so the consequence then is that all the CO2 accumulated by the plant will be released again to the atmosphere when the plant material rot us is burned so when tree planting will only temporarily remove CO2 from the atmosphere unless the trees are somehow buried to prevent them from decay or being burned. So the assumptions we have heard, solar heat input has always been constant. The Earth was in perfect balance. Atmospheric CO2 has always been constant. Man started from 1750 to um, burn fossil fuels which the CO2 has accumulated in the air. This extra CO2 must increase the heat absorbed in the atmosphere. This is catastrophic. The end is near, as you see in the cartoon. And the proof is selected ice cores that show flat CO2 contents uh, and recent rise versus time. Selected trees show similar patterns in the tree rings. Selected surface temperatures show a rising trend. Hence, CO2 must have a long atmospheric lifetime, we are told. So here you see from the third assessment report from IPCC. This is uh, the hockey stick diagram for atmospheric CO2. 
And uh, they said in their first report, the lifetime of CO2 was a rough indication 50 to 200 years. Or Susan Salomon wrote in PNAS uh, a short time ago, more than 1,000 years. That means that the CO2 is accumulating in atmosphere, not going anywhere else. So are these assertions true when tested with geochemical models? So the third assessment report, uh, uh, hockey stick again, and uh, you see that these scenarios involve drastic rises in both air CO2 concentration and surface temperatures. And if we believe that there was a medieval warm period, which is missing from this hockey stick, and the Little Ice Age missing, we should expect, because of the retrograde solubility of CO2 in water, that there should be uh, a fluctuation in the CO2, and not a flat for most of this curve. So how did this all come about? Calendar, he introduced a beautiful mathematical filter, saying that if you look at all those dots in uh, the top left diagram, this shotgun, shotgun plot here, which came from uh, analysis of CO2 in the air, uh, he introduced a filter saying uh, the values that are deviating more than 5% from what I believe is correct, they are, regard they are not taken into account. So then you see that there's a beautiful rise in CO2 from these circle data. And uh, this was taken as, as good signs. Uh, if we look at a 1982 pa uh, paper in Nature by Neftel et al., uh, the black dots and the uncertainties there, they are indicating the CO2 in ice cores. But from 1985, uh, it was a political issue on this. And then they, in the next paper in 1988, they deleted the, the black dots. And now the green are the only ones showing the rise in CO2. Beautiful. Siegenthaler and Ersker, they made this famous top right diagram where they had parallel displaced two curves to fit the data. And they had used the best data they found. These were parts of the ice core that melted during transportation across the equator. So these were not very good data, we will say. Uh, another problem is that if you look at the fossil fuel burning, compare that to the Mauna Loa measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere, there's a 50% error versus the expected CO2 level if all the CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere. This has been nicknamed the, the missing sink, and this proves the IPCC. And if all the CO2 is then being accumulated in the atmosphere, then the emissions and the measurements should match, which you see in this uh, uh, diagram, they don't. So one way to do this, to check this, is to look at the carbon isotopes. And uh, you will see in this uh, CO2 molecule, you have carbon-13. In the other molecule, you have carbon-12. So we can look at the ratio between the carbon-13 and the carbon-12 in the atmosphere. So this is what we in geochemistry call a Caltech plot, where we have plotted something versus nothing. And um, the y-axis, you see something, which is the uh, isotopic ratio of uh, carbon-13 to carbon-12. And the left side, you see some reservoirs, the atmosphere in equilibrium isotopically with the ocean, in equilibrium with limestone precipitating in the ocean. And the biosphere, they like the carbon-12, so they are enriched in carbon-12 and depleted in carbon-13. So if we burn the fossil fuels from biosphere, then we are making the anthropogenic CO2. And if we had only that in the atmosphere, we should have a value of minus 26 in the atmosphere, but we don't. If we had only the, the natural CO2, we would have zero on this uh, mixing scale to the right. So if we look at the values from 1988, uh, we saw about 4% is what was the amount of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere. And this would then mean that the red little thing here is what the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was in terms of the energy withheld. And uh, this would be much smaller than the ability of the clouds to regulate the temperature. So back to the isotopes. Um, we can do a mass balance, isotopic mass balance calculation from the different reservoirs. And we can do this in terms of uh, lifetime. And when we have, as you see in this little pink circle there, the total amount of carbon in the CO2 in the atmosphere with the measured value of the carbon isotopes, there you have the right answer. And you can go down. 
and you can see, okay, the lifetime is about five years, and there's about 4% of CO2 that comes from anthropogenic sources in the atmosphere. 96% is isotopically indistinguishable from non-fossil fuel, that is ocean degassing and uh, juvenile sources, as is a volcanism. So 134 gigatons of carbon, 18% is exchanged each year, far more than the seven gigatons annually released from fossil fuel burning. And we also see with a rough indication of 50 to 200 years, why we create, or not we, IPCC creates the artificial 50% error, uh, nicknamed the missing sink. So if you look at other measurements of this lifetime of CO2, they come up with about five to six years and not the long lifetime as IPCC is claiming. And if you now look at uh, what are the lifetimes of the different parts of the Earth, uh, we see there is the, the, the blue line here is then the, the sea surface uh, from pole through equator to pole. And you can see down to 1,000 meters depth, you have a vertical circulation of about three years. So the, it reacts very fast with the water. And the upper 200 meters has enough calcium to bind all remaining fossil fuel CO2 as calcium carbonate. I'm running out of time. Do I have the time to, to show a small video? I don't know. I have three minutes. It's shorter than that, but there was something else. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So we have a burning light that's a burning fossil fuel, and we put uh, a glass across here. If the CO2 stays in the air and does not dissolve in the water, uh, we will have a permanent situation. If the CO2 is displaced by water because uh, it was dissolving in the water, then the water will rise. And also I have put... Uh, calcium hydroxide in there, so I start a little flashlight, and I can see the whitening of calcium carbonate being formed. So this, we could see in a few seconds, was happening, and uh, it didn't take us hundreds or thousands of years to, uh, to see this. <clears throat> so, there is a link between volcanic CO2 and the sedimentation of calcium carbonate in the sea, as Boduco has showed us. And there is plenty of volcanism appearing uh, along the crustal plate boundaries. And a mantle melt may have up to 8 weight percent CO2 at 125 kilometers depth. And surface lava can only hold 0.01 to 0.001 weight percent CO2 uh, dissolved. So the difference is degas to the atmosphere. So same thing as with the uh, soda bottle. We open up the uh, cap of the soda bottle, and out comes the CO2. Same thing with the volcanoes. And we can calculate how much CO2 could be released from different volcanoes from uh, their eruptions. And there are many times today's anthropogenic annual amount coming up, as we saw in the carbon isotopes. And what about the acidification of the oceans? They say that this trifle amount of CO2 that can uh, dissolve in the sea, because they said all the CO2 will be in, in the atmosphere, this will cause catastrophe by dissolving all calcium carbonate in the sea. And we can test this. And here are the chemical reactions for what is happening here, the CO2 gas, which is uh, dissolving uh, in the water. And uh, IPCC has forgotten there is calcium in the water. And then the net reaction there says CO2 gas plus a calcium in the ocean, plus you have to neutralize the OH minus in the sea because the sea is about pH 8, uh, forming calcium carbonate plus water. And again, the law of mass action says that if you produce more CO2 up there in the atmosphere, you will produce more calcium carbonate in the sea, just like the video was showing. So this illustrates uh, the Henry's law in, uh, in daily use. You have the atmosphere um, between the cap and the bottle and uh, the water, and you have the ocean underneath. And there is a partition coefficient of about 1 to 50, 50 times more CO2 in the ocean versus the atmosphere. So Henry's law dictates that anthropogenic doubling of CO2 in the global atmosphere is impossible. So if this works for the breweries, it probably works out there in the nature as well. I mean, if it's true, Susan Salomon says more than 1,000 years is a lifetime of CO2 before it dissolves in the sea, who would like to start a brewery selling their products, waiting for 1,000 years or more before they can sell their products. <laughs> this is Henry's law in daily use. Okay, acidification, we can see that the natural variation is from about 7.8 to 
and uh, this is in the Western Pacific uh, Ocean uh, without the minerals present. But there are buffers, and we don't hear anything about the buffers, that buffering the, the uh, pH, and we don't hear about the stability of calcium carbonate, which is now uh, pictured here in terms of pH versus the amount of CO2 dissolved in the ocean. And if you add more CO2, you go from the star upwards, and you're still in a stability field of calcite. You cannot do it. You cannot dissolve the calcium carbonate this way. pH must be decreased by two log units, 100 times the H plus concentration in order to dissolve calcium carbonate at 25 degrees C, at zero degrees C, 1.25 units. Then there are more ocean buffers, and all these buffers add up to an infinite buffer capacity according to Stam and Morgan in their uh, aquatic chemistry uh, textbook on this. And Brian Mason says the ocean may thereby act as a self-balancing mechanism in which most of the elements have reached an equilibrium concentration. And the oceans, by controlling the amount of atmospheric CO2, play a vital part in maintaining stable conditions suitable for organic life on Earth. And this is what, we're, what we want, right? But spectacular facts are hard to meet. We see here the positive proof of global warming. And uh, <laughs> the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut, especially this speaker, I believe. Thank you.